Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning, and thanks for joining us. And thanks for everybody who's joined online. I'm standing in for Pastor Jonathan today, who's visiting another church, uh, preaching for them. You've got me this morning and Alex this evening. I also to pray that the Lord would bless our services together today. Our opening scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in your Bible. Thanks. Thankful for Helen playing the piano today, and Sister Shauna for being um, on the techno on the technology. And we pray for Sister Amanda, who's not feeling well today. We have uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 4 to 7, and the Bible says, "And that he was buried." This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Amen. May the Lord bless his holy word to us. We're going to stand to sing our first hymn this morning, and that is Jesus is coming again. What a great thing to talk about, something that should be on the forefront of our minds every day. But it's easy to forget, isn't it, that he's coming again, and we're going to rejoice in that time when he does. May it be today, indeed. Let's stand to sing Jesus is coming again. 239 in the book, and hopefully the words are on the screen. <coughs> day that will be. Jesus is coming again. We're going to have our prayer time just now where I'll take the prayer requests, then I'll lead in prayer while you pray silently. And we're going to, I've got a few already that we know about. If you may have seen that um, uh, Tom Farrell um, went to heaven this week. Um, so we pray for the family there um, and the time of uh, bereavement. We're also praying for William, who uh, continues to be unwell. Um, 
William's had some consultations at the hospital, but is likely to need further tests. And uh, we'll commend him to the Lord as it may uh, require some surgery. Um, we've got the camp, of course, round two. I heard um, great things about the camp this week that's gone. My, my wife was there and she gave me all the reports and it sounds a wonderful time. Um, 180 children, is that right? And many making commitments for the Lord, so we're so thankful for that. Um, so be in prayer for camp week two. This is the uh, teenies, is that right? Good morning, good morning. Are there other prayer requests? Yes. Could we pray for Amanda, please? She's not feeling very well, but she wants to be at camp tomorrow. Yep, we mentioned uh, Amanda, Amanda's unwell, so we're praying for Amanda. If she's watching, we hope you feel well soon and able to go tomorrow. Are there other prayer requests? Yes, Thomas. Um, my family is travelling to Hungary on Thursday. Just for travelling to Hungary. Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Are there other prayer requests this morning? We'll pray for Pastor Jonathan and Natalie. I think Gwyneth's with them as well. Uh, they've gone down. Is it down Baptist Church? Yeah. Yeah, that right? Yeah. So they're visiting another church this morning. So we'll pray for Pastor Jonathan. Are there any others? Yes. Thank you. Unspoken prayer request uh, for Hannah. Yes. Jones, your mum and sister in hospital. <clears throat> Thank you, Joan. Are there any others? Yes. This is the your gran, is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Her partner passed away last week as well um, with COVID, and so she's unable to receive any guests and things because she's got COVID herself. Right. So she's on her own at the moment. Yeah, that's going to be tough. So we'll pray for that whole situation. The Lord's uplifting. Are there others? Maybe Pastora. We'll just wait for her to come in. Are there any other prayer requests? No? Do you have a prayer request, Pastora? Wouldn't want to start without giving you the chance, because you normally do. <laughs> Yeah, we mentioned him earlier. We've got him on the list, yeah. 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 And also for the, um, it's just a praise. Oh, when I say just, it's a massive praise. The Lord is good, and he is... Um, uh, we were uh, praying previously for the, um, uh, one of my tenants, whose name is Spencer. Mm -hmm. He is doing very well. He came out from the hospital. He's back been working, and so... Praise the Lord. Thank you for all your, um, your prayers. And uh, our Lord is great. good. Very That's great good. news, isn't it? Yeah, praise the Lord for, yes. for that news about Spencer. All right, if that's all, then let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer with these prayer requests. Let's pray. A gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we, we thank you and praise you for each one that's come out this morning and for those watching online. And we pray that this would be a very special day for each one of us, that there might be somebody here or watching online who doesn't know you as their saviour, not certain about their place in eternity. We pray that they wouldn't leave this building or sign off uh, the live stream, Lord, without uh, making a commitment to get saved, asking Christ to save them. 
Perhaps there's someone in the room who needs a special blessing from your word. They do know you, um, but there's something special that maybe your word has for them today. And I pray that as I bring the message shortly, that you would please endue me with the words to speak and that it would be all of you and none of me. We ask also, Lord, for the prayer requests that have been mentioned this morning. We pray for um, uh, the family of Tom Farrell, those uh, impacted by his passing away. And we rejoice of his testimony, his life, and the bereavement there, Lord, that uh, you would support each one. Um, we know this is a time of missing people and bereavement, but we rejoice for the promises of Scripture where they become real, how we're going to see our loved ones again. Mm. So we commend the whole family to you. Uh, we pray for William. We ask that you give the consultants continued wisdom in how to help him, and we know he continues to be unwell. We would ask that you would be with him, comfort him, and help him to feel better, and we pray that they may be able to find an answer to the problems that he's got and uh, give them wisdom, we ask you. We give you thanks and rejoice for the testimonies coming back from the first week of Camp Victory, and we ask that, indeed, Lord, you'd bless this forthcoming uh, week uh, for the teenagers, that uh, more commitments would be made for Christ. We know that um, we need the younger generation to come through uh, in our churches and to be strong and stand on the scriptures. And uh, we just pray that this will be a great week for all those involved. We thank you for those who helped uh, for the first week, Lord. And we, we pray that um, their children would go forth in the strength of the Lord. <clears throat> we pray for Amanda. Pray you would help her to make full recovery quickly so she can take part in camp next week. And uh, we also pray for uh, Thomas's tra uh, family who are travelling mercies as they go to Hungary. Think of Pastor Jonathan and family and Gwyneth who are away at the Downham Church this day. Pray you'd be a blessing to each one there. And we pray you'd be with Alex later on, Lord, as he leads the, the service and ministers from uh, the Book of Kings, Lord, for us later on this evening. We have been spoken prayer requests regarding Hannah and Pastora's and spoken prayer requests. We know that you know what these are and we commend them, Lord, to your care and for an answer that they would see your hand mighty in their lives. We would ask for healing and your hand to be upon uh, Joan's uh, mother and sister in hospital and also for Jen's gran who's got COVID and recovering also for a time of loss in isolation and being bereaved. Lord, this must be a tough situation and we do commend her that she would draw uh, especially close and your presence may be felt in a way that only you can provide. So we commend the rest of the service to you this day. We ask above all things that the Lord Jesus would be glorified and everything we do would be an honour to him and that your word would have its way with each one of us this day. And we pray these things in his precious and mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Helen. We're going to sing again. Uh, Jesus, the very thought of the hymn 79 in the hymn book, if you're using that. The words are on the screen, I think. Uh, hymn 79 in the hymn book, Jesus, the very thought of thee. And then we're going to have our scripture reading. Let's stand to see. <laughs> Jesus 
Good singing again. We're now going to have our uh, scripture reading. And after the scripture reading, Daniel uh, is going to come and minister in song for us. Thank you, Daniel. But the scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24 in your Bible. This is the Acts of the Apostles, of course. Oh, sorry, Acts chapter, uh, chapter 26. I do apologize. Acts chapter 26. It was verse 24, Acts chapter 26 and verse 24. And the Bible says, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, so this is Paul the Apostle that we're talking about here, Thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, this is Paul speaking, I am not mad. Most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things were hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of his word. Now, Daniel will now come and minister in song. Thank you, Daniel. And then we'll open the scriptures and see what the Lord has for us. Uh, we were travelling uh, this week to Wales. Um, we had to do a few, a few trips backwards and forwards, and um, I, I was thinking all, all what we have joy in life and uh, our, our fellowship, everything goes so fleeting. It goes so fast. You would oh, should it last longer? Um, and and I seen through this this theme this morning. You're talking about eternity and we'll be with Jesus. And um, um, I was thinking um, there was an illustration that I, I remember from years ago from a, a, a pastor in, uh, in Romania who was saying, imagine, imagine a cube of granite, yeah, a mile long, a mile each edge, um, imagine that. And then imagine a raven coming every day and flicking his beak across the granite like this, just once a day. And when that granite will be finished eroding by the flick of the raven's uh, beak, there will be one second of the eternity. And that'll be where we'll be without Jesus Christ there. Um, in a lot of Romanian songs, there's a lot of talking about the spring and the spring of the soul and, and refreshness and um, refillment. And we were, we were going through the hymn book yesterday. I was trying to, to remember the Romanian hymn book. So we're singing um, a verse and the, re, um, the refrain for each one so I can, I can don't forget them. And I was coming back to this song and you're saying, even if our lives... Um, years are flying and a clear sky we won't see um, every time with my Lord is spring forever and I'll be glad when I'll be with him over there and with our Lord and uh, the next song um, I'm gonna sing it says it's, it just tell us tells us everything that we need to do to be with Jesus Christ in eternity with him forever I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He, he tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he all my grief has taken, and all the sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempts me so, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. 
He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by fate and do his blessed will. I have all of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my sun hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. It's a real blessing, wasn't it? And thank you for the thoughts uh, in the lead up to that as well. We really do appreciate it. Right. Let me get this thing going. Let's get tuned into the Word of God then, shall we? Uh, Gospel of Mark, if you would. Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> now I want to talk this morning about something that God could not hide. Something that God could not hide. Now the God described in this Bible is able to hide a lot of things if he wants to, and oftentimes he does. And some might say that God hides himself too much. You know, a man would always like to see more of the Lord, have him reveal himself more than he does in this life, and that's understandable. Even the psalmist said in Psalm 10, our first scripture this morning, Psalm chapter 10, verse 1. Even the psalmist said, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou, self, uh, uh, thou thyself in times of trouble? Fourteen times in the psalms alone, the psalmist says words to the effect, Lord, don't hide yourself from me. So the Lord hiding himself was something familiar to the psalmist. And you take the rapture, for example. This is the time when Jesus Christ returns for Christians. He's hidden from us now, isn't he? But if you're a Christian here this morning, wouldn't it just make you a day if Christ came back before I'm finished preaching? <laughs> amen and amen. Consider salvation for a moment. The prophets, the Bible says, they tried diligently to search out God's plan of salvation, but they couldn't find it. It was hidden from them. Have a look at these scriptures in First Peter chapter one, verse ten. First Peter chapter one, verse ten. It says, "Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ that within them did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. You see, the way that you and I find God is by God choosing a means to reveal himself to you. And of course, in this age, he tells you in this book how he's revealed himself. But the problem is, with most people, is they don't go to where they can find him. And my question to you this morning is, have you done that? So God hides himself when he pleases, and he hides things as well. You know, he can scatter the true remnant of Israel throughout the world until it's the right time for them to be gathered and be revealed. You think about the ministry of the church. He hid that for 4,000 years after Adam and Eve showed up. He didn't reveal it, did he? But to Paul the apostle. He can hide individuals as well. He hid Elijah, didn't he? He hid him in the, by the brook and fed him with ravens and fed him and hid him there for about three and a half years. The prophets were hid where Ahab couldn't get hold of them. God hid little Prince Josiah there in the nursery when Athaliah was out to kill the king's seed and he was there about five or six years without being caught. So it's clear from the scriptures that God can hide things. He can hide himself from time to time. And in fact, he can hide anything he wants. But, but the great news is this morning there was something he couldn't hide. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Mark chapter 1 then. Mark chapter 1 in your Bible. Now what follows is I'm going to read a number of verses from the book of Mark back to back. So you need to try and keep up, okay? I think they're going to be on the screen as well. So uh, we're going to start in Mark chapter 1, verse 28. And these all are verses on the theme 
of Christ's ministry. And we're going to take them all together because you'll see why in just a second. Mark chapter 1 verse 28 then. And immediately his fame, this is talking of the Lord Jesus, his fame spread abroad through all the region around Gal about Galilee. Have a look down at verse 45 of Mark chapter 1. Now this verse here is talking about Jesus healing a leprous man. And Jesus told this man, don't say anything about it. But he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Look at the verse, it says, but he went out and began to publish it abroad. Look at the wording here. And to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in, the desert, in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Look at this, verse 2. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Mark chapter 3, verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea. And from beyond Jordan and about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard what great things he did, they came to him, unto him. Drop down to verse 10. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many had plagues. And finally, chapter 7, verse 24. Chapter 7, verse 24. This is the key verse, folks. And from thence he arose and went into the border of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a house and would have no man know it. Look at this. But he could not be hid. He could not be hid. And we'll stop there. Now in that last verse it says that he went to this house after the multitudes had been following all over the place. And he, just have, he said, I want no man to know of it. In other words, don't tell him that I'm there. But the Bible says he could not be hid. So there's something here that God could not hide. And what good God could not hide was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He could not be hid. And there were some good reasons for that. And that's what I want to speak about this morning. The first reason then he could not be hid is because of his love for sinners. Because of his love for sinners. See, anybody that loved like Jesus Christ loved would have to be noticed. Any perfect, innocent man coming down from heaven to give his life for his enemies is going to get noticed. The Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled by God, by, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, the Bible says. You see, if God's nature is love, and hopefully all, we all agree with that, then he had to manifest that love somehow, didn't he? And if it's going to be manifested, you can see it. You can't hide something like that. It can't be a secret love. It can't be a hidden love. It has to be out there in the open. It has to be like the smell, if you remember, from Mary's precious ointment when she, she broke that box and the Bible says the fragrance, the perfume, filled the whole house. Uh, the love of Jesus could not be hid. You know it's there. What about 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16? Many of you will be able to quote this anyway. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. He was shown, he was declared, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. So Jesus Christ could not be hid because he had to manifest God's love. The Bible says that he was in the bosom of the Father and he couldn't stay hidden. Uh, the Bible says, First John chapter, uh, sorry, John chapter one, verse eighteen. John one eighteen says this: No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, this is Christ, which is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared Him. He declared the Father out in the open, because He came to manifest God as God in the flesh. So Jesus Christ was declared in the open, and when He was, He could no longer be hid. One preacher said one time, I quite like this, he says, he was motherless on the bosom of his father, and he was fatherless on the bosom of his mother. 
And isn't that quite something? He had no mother when he was in the father's bosom. He had no earthly father when he was on Mary's bosom as a babe. Someone else one time said he was older than his mother when he was born. Let's see, work that one out. <laughs> so he could not be hid. So that's the first reason. Now the second, verse, uh, second reason I want to talk about, he couldn't be hid, is because of his death and his resurrection. Now understand that God planned Christ's death the way the Bible says it was going to happen. Um, and that's because before Christ showed up as a man on this earth, God promised him first eternal life. The book of Titus says in the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. Check out 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. A really interesting verse here. It's talking about with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse 20. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but is manifest in these last times for you. See, we're told in these passages here that before Genesis 1-1, God made a commitment to somebody of eternal life. Now, who could that have been to? There was only one person there who that could relate to, and that's God the Son. So Christ dies openly on the cross. The human part of him says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, it's not easy when you see the man Christ Jesus dying under the wrath of God. It's, not e it's easy to, to, to think this is the end of him. But God the Father made a promise to him, and he, he kind of said, Son... When you're born as a man down there, when, when the word becomes flesh and dwells amongst the lost and dies to save the lost, you're not going to stay buried when you're placed in that tomb. You're going to come up. And the question is, how could you hide a thing like that? Have a look at our opening scripture this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4. You'll see why we read these verses in the theme of what we're talking about this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, it says that he was buried, it's talking about Christ, that he rose again, the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, look at this, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. How are you going to hide the testimony of 500 witnesses? How are you going to shut them up? 500 witnesses, the Bible says, saw him alive after he'd been buried. 500 of them. How are you going to hide a thing like that? That'll get around. That news will spread. If you think about it, you only need 12 to agree, beyond reasonable doubt, to convict someone in a court of law, let alone 500. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, you know, are you saying you don't believe the witness of 500 Although in the, the law of this land allows 12 people to be in agreement to convict someone of life, for life. The testimony of 500 witnesses. So God planned his death before he was born. And God intended to show up on this earth as a man so that you could have contact with him. And even if some people aren't grateful for me, I'll ever be eternally grateful for God coming down here and be willing to be like me for a while. Because if you think about it, I could have never understood God without that happening. And neither could you. And this is really, really important because without Christ coming and being revealed as a man and declaring the Father, we would never understand God. And you know, to me, this day, it's a, it's a mystery when I think about God and who he is. It might not be for you, but it is for me. And I have to be honest, even though I've been saved now like 34 years, I still don't get it all the time. You know, when I, I go out and about, I'm outside a lot of the time, if I'm on my bike or walking or whatever, and I look into the highways and the byways and the mountains and in the, you're in the cities and you start thinking about God. If you think, this God knows everything that's going on in the minds of everyone I can see, and he knows all of it all at the same time. How do you work that out? I mean, that stumps my mind. I can't get my head around it. But the book says he does it, so he must do it. And some, sometimes people say, you mean you're telling me that the, the God of this book knows everything that's going on in the minds of everyone in this congregation right now? You know, He knows who's saved in the room today. He knows who's sitting there wishing that I'd finish already. <laughs> he knows who's paying attention and who's not. And uh, this is the God 
that we try and understand. We wouldn't know him if Christ hadn't come. How does your mind grasp something like that? I can, can't understand it all. I can't understand how God does it. But one thing I'll tell you I can understand and you can understand is that when he came down here as a man, we can understand that. We can understand that. And that's the love of Christ for sinners. And you're not going to stop the news of that spreading. You can't. I read a story about a boy, a 14-year-old boy one time, and his dad was a, a missionary. And his dad had to spend something like 10 months abroad uh, without seeing him at a time. And during that time, the lad was at boarding school. And as Christmas time came up, the headmaster of the uh, school came to this boy and said, Son, he said, what would you like to have most of all for Christmas? And the, po the boy pointed to a picture of his dad that was on the desk. And he said, I'd like to have my dad step out of that picture. He wanted to see his father. And do you know what God had to do for you? He had to step out of where he was and become, come down here as a man so that you could understand him, so that you could see him. And when he came as a man, the Lord Jesus said, he that has seen me hath seen the what? The Father. The Father. Absolutely. First, uh, John chapter 14, verse 9. You couldn't keep something that, like that hid. It's too big. That's two reasons. The third reason, then, Christ couldn't be here is because of his baptism. If you think about his baptism, he had to get baptised openly, didn't he? The man that baptised him, John, he didn't have a building where you could, like, here and under here. I hope it doesn't give way, but under here is a, a baptistry. It's not full of water at the moment, but that's where we baptise. He didn't have anything like that. He had to be baptised out in the open. You could see it. How are you going to hide something like that? He's out there in the wilderness, and John says... Uh, behold, the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. There was a crowd out there. The Bible doesn't say how many, but it could have been five, six, seven thousand people watching him get baptized. You can't hide something like that. He had to take his place with the sinners at his baptism. Is that something you've done? John the Baptist said, I need to be baptized by you instead of you, you baptizing me. And Jesus said, it, Look, it becometh all right to fulfill all righteousness. For him to do that to the Lord Jesus. He took his place with the sinners at baptism. Why? Because he came to die for sinners. How are you going to hide that? How are you going to cover it up? So that's three things we've seen, isn't it? Now we're going to look at the fourth reason out of eight reasons we've got this morning why he couldn't be here. And this was a testimony of his birth. Think about it. God Almighty tried to hide his son, didn't he? Think about it. He slipped him into a manger in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night. Just Joseph and Mary. No, no wise men were there, as the Christmas cards suggest. That was later. And then, do you know what happened? The angels come along and proclaim his birth. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord come down to where they're keeping their flocks by night and told some shepherds all about it. And they went and spread that thing all over the country. They, they saw that baby and went out there and it was blah, 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 just spreading the word. Luke chapter 2, verse 15. We'll have a read of this and you can see what I mean. Luke chapter 2, verse 15. Very familiar with these verses. Some of you may read them at Christmas time. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one, other, one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing that's come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they'd seen it, look at this, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child couldn't hide his love you couldn't hide his death you couldn't hide his baptism you couldn't hide his birth and fifthly you couldn't hide his power to heal and save his healing miracles could not be hid now we know there's some people that go around saying they've got the power to heal and so on and uh, and uh, we don't believe that they have uh, this day and age we think that was a gift for the apostles now what i can do for you is i can pray for you i can do that but you know, when you, I don't know if you're like me, but when you see someone who's really suffering, there are days that I really wish that God had given me the power to heal like he did his son and the apostles. Boy, what a time of it I'd have if I had a power like that. For the first thing right now, you'd be staring into thin air because I wouldn't be here. <laughs> if I had a power like that, I'd be in the hospitals emptying it. That's where I'd be. Wouldn't it be something to walk up to some guy dying of cancer and saying, get up, go home, you're healed. You wouldn't shut up news like that. I don't reckon even the news media could cover up a truth like that. You know, if I was able to do that through the power that God gave me, it'd all over the country in an hour. Imagine going down the line, touching someone who's blind, you can see. Someone who's sick, rise up, go home. Someone who's never walked in their life, rise up and run out. Imagine being able to do that. 
How would you keep a lid on it? And you see, Christ had people following all his life. He had little privacy at all. Even the crowds, they took a chance on going hungry, didn't they? When they followed him out in the wilderness, 5,000 of them, multitudes all the time. And the Bible uses that word multitude. You know, it talks about multitudes of people. It uses that word multitude over 90 times in the Gospels alone, talking about how the multitudes followed Christ. He could not be hid. God can hide a lot of things, couldn't hide his son. How are you going to hide a man who says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 1 said he's the light of men. Later the Bible says, I am the bread of life, I'm the good shepherd. How do you hide that? I mean, if it wasn't God in the flesh making claims like that, then surely he was a faker. You know, the very idea of someone standing up and making a confession like that, look at me, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. What a thing to say if it wasn't true. But we know it was true. Well, after a man makes a statement like that, how would you be able to move around without the whole world wanting to know, is it true or not? We'll follow him, see what happens next. He could not be hid because of his power and the multitude saw it. There was a preacher one time who, who was quite a young pastor. He wanted to preach his first funeral service. And he thought, well, I want to do a great job of it and I want to represent Christ faithfully. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pick up my Bible and I'm going to try and find a kind of sample of a funeral uh, from the sermon that Jesus preached. But Jesus Christ didn't preach funeral services, did he? You know, if, if he went to a funeral, the dead person got up and walked out. And if you think about it, don't you really think that the story of someone coming back from the dead, like Lazarus out of the tomb after four days, how could that stay hid? Anybody who could do what Christ did was going to get noticed and be talked about. So that's five things that we've seen. Now the sixth reason he couldn't be hid is the word spread of him like wildfire. Now I can't prove this, so this is just speculation, and I caveat that before I say it. But I'm sure, if you think about it, I think it's reasonable, that by the time Christ finished his ministry, there were people in Spain, Italy, France, Sweden, Russia, you name it, they knew about it, just by word of mouth. You see, don't you think that if dead people were coming out of the ground, that's what people would be talking about? All over Palestine, what about these fishermen? What about the merchants? What about the, the, those travelling around the Mediterranean, all over the Balkans, all over Greece, Spain, France, Italy, North Africa? That news is going to go all over the place. I mean, have you ever stopped to imagine how far in a year, remember his ministry was three years, half years, wasn't it? How, how far in a year you can go on a in a boat or on a horse? I had to look at this on the internet because I know nothing about horses, but it tells me that even if you give adequate time to rest for the horse, you can travel at least 700 miles a month on a horse. A month. That's a long way. You're bound to talk to somebody and they, about the things you've seen, and they go and tell someone else, and they tell someone else, and so on and so on. And that's why we read Acts 26, 26. Do you remember that verse? Acts 26, 26. Paul here is being questioned by uh, Festus, I think it was, in the passage. And he says this, For the king knoweth these things. He says, don't act as if you don't know what I'm on about. He says, you know these things, before whom I speak freely. And look what he says, For I am persuaded none of these things are hidden from him, because it wasn't done in a corner. These things didn't happen just over here, hidden in a closet somewhere. Paul's saying that when we think about the death and the resurrection of Christ, this wasn't done in a corner, O king, he's saying. You know, like in secret or anything. He says, come on, you're the king, you know these things, if you're honest with yourself. It wasn't done behind closed doors, it was right out in the open. Because Paul knew you can't hide the news of someone that, was, that couldn't stay buried. You would think that if you bury someone, that would be enough, wouldn't you? You know, hide him away, roll the, the stone across the, t the uh, tomb door. That's hiding him, isn't it? But it didn't work, did it? We sing, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. One preacher said one time, the early Christians' witnesses just took Jesus Christ and they scattered him over the Roman Empire because they, they talked about him, they spoke about him far and wide. And you know something? If, if, if Christ was alive today... And he went down to the graveyards and, and someone that had been dead there four days came up and the newspapers got hold of it. Now I reckon most people in the world would know about it in no time. 
You know, any of the people that probably didn't have a TV or the internet or a phone or a newspaper, they probably didn't know, but then they might get it from someone else through word of mouth. It'd be out to billions of people in 24 hours on social media, just like that. So he could not be hid. Two more to go then. The seventh reason was his interesting one, his lack of substance. Lack of substance. In other words, he didn't have any possessions. What did that mean? Well, he couldn't be hid because he relied on so many people for his material needs. Luke chapter 8 talks about uh, many ministering to the Lord Jesus for their substance. So you think about it. All that time he was ministering, he had no means of self-sustenance. He had to borrow everything. And that got him noticed. If you think about it, he even had to borrow a baby's crib, a manger. (laughs) He had to borrow a boat. When he spoke to people from the seaside, he didn't have any possessions. You think about the one who made the universe, didn't even have a boat to go in. And if he's today, he wouldn't have a car. He certainly wouldn't have a Popemobile anyway. Um, He had no income either. The Apostle Peter, if you remember in uh, Matthew chapter 17, the Apostle Peter needed some tax money. And Christ told him, go and catch that fish over there and get it. If you think about it, Christ borrowing money from a fish. He had to borrow a cross. And he had to borrow a cross because he hadn't committed any crimes to get one. He couldn't get his own cross. He had to take someone else's. Had to borrow a tomb. How are you going to keep something like that hidden? Jesus gets around, you can't hide him, you can't cover him up. And the eighth and final reason I'll mention this morning why he couldn't be hid is the scriptures wouldn't allow him to be hid. This is an interesting one. Now the reason that he wasn't going to stay hidden in that manger as a child is because the scriptures, the Bible, prophesied about him coming to save sinners. And Jesus Christ had so much respect, so much compliance to what the word of God said and prophecy that he wouldn't even go to a place if it was going to mess up the prophecy of scripture. I think that's interesting. We're told there in John chapter 6 that they came to make him king and he departed from them and went across the sea to get away from them because it wasn't time for him to become king. Have a look at John chapter 2, sorry, John chapter 7 verse 2. John chapter 7, verse 2. It says here, now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And his brethren, therefore said unto him, is talking to Christ, said, Depart thence and go into Judea, that the disciples also may see the work that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to know openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Look what Jesus said. My time is not yet come. But your time is always ready. See, this was at the Feast of Tabernacles. His brethren, this is me paraphrasing, okay? He's saying, are are you going to the Feast of Tabernacles then? Because you would normally expect Christ to do that. He says, no. Are you going down to where they're going to have the feast? And Christ says, well, I'm going to go later, but I'm not going now in the open. Why? Because at that time, the Jews sought to kill him, the Bible says. And he's not going to let anybody put him to death except on the way the Bible says he's going to be put to death. You see, this is really interesting, I think. He has the will of God and the scriptural prophecy on his mind the whole time. He's living. See, when you think about the power of Christ, didn't he have at any time, he had the power to speak the word and got rid of all of those that wanted to kill him? Of course he did. He had the power to do that. But why didn't he? Because he was bound by the word of scripture. And I think this is interesting. That the prophecy of scripture was so powerful that it controlled the actions of the Son of God. It controlled the actions of the author of the word. Let's see you figure that out. How are you going to hide him when the book says every eye shall see him? Now I'll grant you that when he came the first time, every eye didn't see him. But every eye is going to see him one day, isn't it? Aren't they? But plenty of people did see him back then. He had to suffer publicly. He died publicly. It was out in the open. It wasn't kind of in a prison courtyard that his life was taken. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, the Bible says. It was a public spectacle. It could not be hid. And he's coming back, the Bible says. And when he comes back at some future day, every eye is going to see that, whether they want to or not. Now, I was thinking about this, and you think, can you imagine when those words were written 2,000 years ago? You know, every eye will see him. I'm sure that some people must have thought, well, that's just impossible, isn't it? I mean, how's someone kind of in Greece and someone in Africa and all of them are going to see him? But when you think about that today, 
You know, when news and cameras can bring you images of what's going on anywhere, anywhere in the world in seconds, it kind of sounds very believable, doesn't it? So we may well ask, well, if he's so manifest, like the Bible says he is, then how on earth are some people so blind spiritually that they don't see him now? Well, a lot of the time it's because people don't seek him. They, they don't seek him as they should. They don't look for Christ as, as they need to. And, you know, I'd ask you and those watching online, have you sought him this morning? Have you sought him? And if not, why not? You know, he's not hidden. He wasn't hidden then. He's not hidden now. If you care to open the pages of this book, you're going to find him. You know, when he came, a lot of people who uh, saw him didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize him because he didn't look how they expected him to look. You know, they thought Messiah was going to come like some sort of triumphant king with this entourage, you know. And I don't know if you've seen any of these films, but the world makes all these kind of films, don't they? I can't give you the title of any. I think one of them is called Trading Places, where there's someone who's rich and noble, but they're disguised as a poor person. And then later on, they're revealed to be what they really are, to teach some kind of lesson. Well, you know, that reminds us, doesn't it, of Christ, how being poor but was... Uh, but later on being uh, revealed as king of kings. I read a story about Queen Victoria. She sometimes did this. She would go and check up on certain things, but she was in disguise as an ordinary woman. Uh, now she'd have a couple of servants with her so that they could keep things in order. And one day she was, you know, dressed a little kind of secretly. Um, she went to see the estate of somebody who was one of the noble people just dressed as an, uh, as a, as an ordinary woman and this sheep herder boy came through, you know, lots of sheep herd and everything, and she happened to stumble. And um, when she stumbled, she scattered a couple of these sheep, and, uh, sheep, and um, she got up and kept walking, but um, this uh, kid who was driving the sheep got up and said, get out of the way, you clumsy woman. And the servant took him aside and said, do you know who you're just talking about? <laughs> he said, no. He says, this is your queen, no less, Queen Victoria. And this shepherd lad says, well, if she'd been dressed like the queen, then I'd have recognised her, wouldn't I? See? And the thing is, Christ came the first time as king of the Jews, but never showed up in the garment of a king. He was wearing kind of a fisherman's um, clothing there, and that's the garments they cast lot for when he was crucified. So the Lord Jesus could not be hid, and that's because he wants you to find him. My question is, have you found him this morning? If you want to find Christ, then we can tell you where to find him real quick. And like I say, you just open the page of this Bible, but many won't read it so that they find him. Now, I don't know who wrote this, um, but someone wrote, and I couldn't find the author of it, but it wasn't me, but I quite liked it anyway, and it says this, I find my Lord Jesus in the Bible wherever I happen to look. He is the theme of my Bible, the center and heart of every book. Wherever I open my Bible, my Lord is always there. He at the beginning, at the book's beginning, gave to the earth its form. He was the ark of shelter bearing the wrath of the storm. Whenever I open my Bible, I see the Son of God, the ram on Mount Moriah, Jacob's ladder from earth to sky, the scarlet cord in the window, the brass serpent lifted up on high, the face of my Lord I discover whenever I open this book. I wish I'd have written that. I couldn't have written that. <laughs> But this, you see, this is why this book is powerful. It's why they say this book will keep you from your sins or your sins will keep you from this book. <laughs> see, too many today don't want to see him, even though he was not hid. How about you? You know, some folks are like Adam and Eve, aren't they? They're hiding behind the trees of the garden. And if that's you this morning, don't leave it too late. Otherwise, you will join those later on. You know, it talk about them in the book of Revelation where they're saying they, they actually want to be hidden from him. They say rocks fall on us, mountains cover us from the face of the Lamb for the day of his wrath is come. Who would be able to stand? They're going to say, hide me, cover me up, because I can't bear to look at him. So he couldn't be hidden at his birth. He couldn't be hidden at his, in his ministry, at his death, at his resurrection. And he's going to be made manifest to all when he comes again, the Bible says. The Bible says he's coming of King of kings and Lord of lords. And at the name of Jesus, every and he shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you confess with your mouth, don't you? And if you're not a Christian here this morning, you're going to have to confess him one day anyway. So the Bible says there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. What name could that be? And that's the name of Jesus, isn't it? No one else in history 
of the world has got anything to do with that. So what we've seen this morning is that God can hide many things, oftentimes he does, including himself. But we can rejoice, I think, and thank God that there was something he couldn't hide, and that was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He couldn't be hid because we love for sinners. He couldn't be hid because he died openly and rose again. He couldn't be hid because of his public baptism and the testimony of his birth. He couldn't be hid because of his power to heal and to save, and because of the word of him spread so much near and far. He couldn't be hid because of his lack of substance, and finally, he could not be hid because the scriptures would not allow him to be hid. Now, in closing, there may be, maybe there's someone here this morning, maybe watching online, who, you're saved, you're a Christian, but you're trying to hide from the Lord. Hiding because of the life you live is not the life you should be living. Something's happened, we don't know what it is, and, but you're not living for Christ as you should do for some reason. You know, the Lord is not hid from you this morning, if that's you. You remember the story of the prodigal son, that father, he was looking every moment of every day, waiting for that return. Why don't you come back to the Lord this morning? Why not come back to him, confess your sins, be the person he wants you to be. What have you got to gain by delaying? But then there may be someone here who doesn't know Christ as their saviour. If that's the case, Christ seems to be hidden from you this morning, but he's not. If you look for him and seek him, you'll find him. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you. So that's my earnest prayer that you'll find Christ who guarantees, not many guarantees in this life, but this is one of them. He guarantees to save you this morning if you'll ask him, the one who could not be hid. Amen. Amen. We are going to sing our final hymn before we have some notices. <coughs> And our final hymn is Praise Him, Praise Him, so, um, hymn 106, <clears throat> Praise Him, Praise Him, hymn 106, and we all stand to sing. Joy.
Please be seated. We've just got some notices now. In the uh, going, what's going on in the life and ministry of our church? I just wanted to repeat my thanks again to Helen playing the piano. Thank you, and for the media team as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm assuming it's gone well. It's the thing you stand up here thinking there's someone behind the camera. You hope so, but uh, they haven't waved at me and said it's not the case. So, uh, yeah, thanks to everyone online that's joined us today. But um, we've got some notices here, and we've got a happy birthday. <coughs> Yesterday, I'm looking in Richard's direction. Um, we need to sing, don't we? Yeah, we need to sing. Uh, Helen and I agree. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. He thought you were hiding there, thinking it wasn't going to happen. He was, he was like this, keeping his head down. But, uh, and he could not escape. Um, and um, we've got uh, some refreshments uh, later. Uh, I think this is what's being prepared here. And we've got, Tamas, you've got a birthday coming up. Yeah, uh, I've seen that on here. We uh, should have uh, included you in that. But that's later this week, so we'll get you next Sunday. <laughs> I, I didn't know that, see, because on, on here I just get the thing, I haven't got the slides on here, and I didn't, I, I was going to be discreet, you see, I was going to be discreet, but it's all out now anyway, so uh, that's the end of discretion gone, so happy birthday for Thomas, what, what day is it? Uh, the third, Wednesday, I think, Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday, happy birthday for Tuesday. Um, this evening, six o'clock, is the... Uh, our evening service tonight, be here if you wish to be here or you can join it online. Alex Triffitt, one of our deacons, continues his series in Second Kings. Second Kings, uh, Pastor Jonathan being away as I mentioned earlier. Now please bring in prayer for the uh, teen campers um, and the leaders that are heading to Camp Victory this week. Um, now if anybody in the, that it, it affects anybody in the room then please note that it's 10 o'clock tomorrow the leaving time from here. It's not 9.45, okay? Um, it's 10 o'clock. On Monday afternoon, at uh, noon till 2 o'clock, we have the City Centre Evangelism in Peterborough. Um, again, if you'd like to be involved in that, then you can speak to Brother Steve here. He's um, holding the fort there, I think, this this t uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Steve, is that right? Yeah. Um, and everyone's welcome. If you can't join that ministry because you're busy or whatever, then please be in prayer for that as the literature gets handed out in the city centre. On Wednesday evening, here in the building, um, Pastor Jonathan continues at 7 o'clock in the Bible study and prayer time. He continues the series on Baptist Distinctive series. The ladies' Bible study meeting uh, for fellowship this um, Friday. And you can see Ulrika about details for that meeting. I think that's just like a fellowship meeting, isn't it? It's not a, a Bible study because of the camps that are going on. What time is that? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Here okay. in the church. Here in this building, 10 o'clock on Friday. Now, if you're a member of this church, at 9.30 on Saturday on Microsoft Teams, there is a quarterly update on finances. Um, so if you can make that, um, please be uh, uh, online at that time. On Saturday also is an outreach in Boston. As you know, there's a new church plant in Boston. We're supporting them. That's from noon till 2 o'clock. Meet in front of Holland and Barrett in Boston, it says here, uh, in the town centre. That's on Saturday, noon till 2, if you can make it. Again, sounding a bit like a stuck record, but if you're not there, then please remember that ministry in prayer. Now, this one's important. Um, don't be here next Sunday morning because you'll be on your own. Okay? We're not here um, as most of you know, but the church, has, uh, we thank the Lord for this. It's a great problem to have, but the church has grown so much that we can't get everyone in, in the mornings and the evenings. Um, we would be literally spilling out the doors. So um, the congregation is split uh, morning and evening. But next Sunday, we're going to be meeting all together. And we've got a, a good venue that's uh, plenty of space at the Key Theatre near the Embankment, uh, near the Neen River there. And um, that's at 10.30, and it's going to be 
uh, we're going to include the Lord's Supper. So everyone's welcome, and there's a river baptism to follow. Um, so we'll do, drive our cars from, cars from there and go up to the top bit of Ferry Meadows where there's some free parking, and we'll walk down to the river there. Um, be in prayer for the weather. Um, we think the, uh, the temperature will probably be okay, and the water will probably be okay, but um, uh, be in prayer for the weather there, river baptism on Sunday. There'll be no evening service that Sunday. And then looking ahead on the 14th of August, it's time to get your football boots out and your shin pads because it's the church family five-a-side football and feast fun day. They tried to get how many Fs they could get in there. Um, and there's a sign-up with Amanda or Belinda for the football team. Uh, and anybody that wants to come, please just uh, speak to somebody about signing up because we need to know how many people to cater for. The sign-up sheets are on the front here, just where the flowers are. On the okay, sign-up sheets are here. Um, doesn't mean that you're doing anything or you have to bring anything. It just means that we can know how many people are coming so we can cater for everybody. Good, well, that's it. Um, thank you for coming and for those online watching. We're gonna, for those in the building, we're going to have time of uh, some fellowship now. I think there's some tea and maybe some refreshments. Um, no one, you're not obliged to stay for that. If you need to move on, that's absolutely fine. And um, we'll close our service in prayer just now, shall we? Let's pray. Oh, Brother Steve, you'll finish, if you close in prayer for us, thank you. Oh God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for being a wonderful and mighty God. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for the desire to be here. Thank you for the desire to hear your word. Thank you for the desire of Rob to preach your word. Thank you for feeding us. Thank you for encouraging us. Thank you for building us up in the most holy faith. Father, we most of all, we thank you for not hiding yourself from us, that you revealed yourself to us and saved us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Father, we just pray for those uh, here or online that do not, do not know you, Lord that you would not hide yourself from them, but that they might come to salvation too and enjoy the wonderful blessing of a future with you one day. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. As we go from this place, Lord, we pray that you'll be with us, that hearts might rejoice that you've spoken to us. Father, we pray that you'll bless our fellowship as we stop behind, just minister to... Uh, to us through each other. We ask it through the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve.